Well, since we're just talking about Oppenheimer, it might be good for us to talk about something that's older than the atomic bomb. So let's talk about Glitch McConnell. Welcome to Millennial, the home of pretend adulting and real talk. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. And for our penultimate episode of the year, we will look back at the year that was 2023. We came up with a pretty exhaustive list of items. We were particularly fascinated with things that happened at the beginning of the year because we forgot many of these items. (laughs) We also, and this came up in our planning meeting, executive producer patrons can check it out. We once again struggled with understanding time, especially in this post-COVID era, because we were reviewing 2023. And I said, oh, Liz Truss, right? That happened this year. And we were all unsure. And then I looked it up and it actually happened in 2022. What? But the lettuce feels so much more recent. It does. Mm -hmm. The head of lettuce. So we we had like the prime minister kerfuffle and the queen's death both in 2022 that's wild like it feels like one of those should have been this year yeah and then behind the scenes and our patrons may have caught this once or twice i was like i just know i've been keeping a log of things happening in 2023 (laughs) i would keep it in the google doc so that way we could just keep adding things as the year went on it didn't have to work as hard at the end of the year and i kept looking through our old google docs i was like where is that list where is that list couldn't find it So then finally, I went to a doc from 2022, and that's where I was keeping a log. I never did it this year, but I could have sworn I was doing it in 2023. Well, Laura and I could have sworn you were doing it this year, too. Yeah. You were like, surely you didn't check as thoroughly as you thought. (laughs) You're terrible at research, Andrew. (laughs) Get get better at looking at our archives. No, but I, I was shook. This is the millennial Mandela effect right here. It's been happening quite a bit. It's uh, (laughs) just all losing our minds, I guess. I don't know. Slowly but surely. Alzheimer's (laughs) is seeping in. Oh, no. I hope it's not that. Hey, I've got... mm, I wonder if I should come out with this soon or not. Mm, My hair, I feel like, has been thinning out, speaking of getting older. So I'm looking at hair regrowth options to thicken it up again oh, okay yeah so not alzheimer's but um i feel like i'm going bald <laughs> is your so. um is your maternal grandfather does he have good hair he doesn't have like a full head of hair his hair is definitely thin i've heard this too though pam it skips okay. a generation uh, okay. look i just i go into starbucks and i i look at myself with the top down lighting no, okay. and i could see straight into my scalp <laughs> That happens to me, too. And I feel like like my hair looks fine on camera, which is all that matters, I guess. Yes, as does mine on camera. But I don't know. I've just gotten more paranoid about it. Mm -hmm. It's also a natural part of aging. I think once you hit your mid-30s, most everybody experiences some thinning or a little bit of like hairline recession. And Andrew, there are absolutely services out there you can sign up for. I know people who've done uh, hymns for hair loss. That's what I signed up for that. They sell that at Target now. They've seen a lot of success with it. So great. great. What I'm saying is it doesn't have to be hard or intimidating. Thank you. Well, you know, coming out on the pod about it, it's like I'm taking some medicine to fix my... The, I did order the oral ones. I, I came out to Pat with this last week, too. I'm like, Pat, I'm having a midlife crisis. He's like, uh-oh, what now? I said, I'm I'm getting hair regrowth medication. I'm I'm ordering it. And he was actually very supportive. I mean, let us know if it works, because... Yeah. I mean, like, Laura and I might at some point feel like we need to get on that shit, so... There you go. I feel like... The, and the thing is, too, you, you know, obviously this is like a... Um, like like a very heavily documented problem for men, not so much for women, but like mm. for women, hair is such a big deal. So, yeah, yes, yeah. and women experience hair loss too. You know, I think it's yes. it's important to Stress. normalize it. And I, you know, I really admire you, Andrew. Oh, you're thanks. I mean, Thank you. part of this show's experience is that people, a lot of people who listen to it have grown up with us and are kind of in the same 
spot we all are right now. And it can just be reassuring to hear that other people are going through the same thing that you're going through yeah. or have the same questions that you yeah. have about what's happening to your body. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. it could be helpful to hear stuff also, like that. I agree. Worst case scenario, you look great with like a short crop hair cut. So thanks. If True. You need to go short. No big deal. You'll still look great. Anyway, well, thank you for letting me uh, come clean about that. It takes a really long time to regrow. Like, it really doesn't start kicking in until like five months in or something like that. I, of course, it can vary depending on who you are. So I might not have an update for a while. But I will let you know because it has been bugging me when I look in the mirror. So, of course, people are not going to go look at the video. And they're going to be like, Andrew, what the hell are you talking about? But I swear, I swear. So anyway, our holiday episode is coming up next week. Chloe's going to be here. Pat and Mark are going to be here. We're going to do our annual gift exchange. It's a secret Santa. So that's always fun. We're also going to be recording at 11 a.m. Eastern this upcoming Saturday. So bust out the mimosas. We will review our 2023 predictions, see what did, did and did not come true. And then we will make predictions for 2024 and do a couple other things to wrap up the year. So that'll be a good time. Stay tuned for that. Even though we're recording on Saturday, it will be out the following Wednesday as usual. Also, just a little reminder, we would love a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And wouldn't you know it, here is a review now we got this week from Millennial Muggle. Thankful to have found this podcast, love the discussions, and find myself laughing and reacting right alongside the hosts. Thanks, Andrew, Laura, and Pam for entertaining this Millennial Weekly. That's very sweet. Thank you, Millennial Muggle. And Pam, what is coming up in After Dark today for our patrons? We're going to come clean about whether or not we keep tabs on people we can't stand on social media and what motivates us to hate stock and, yeah, kind of delve into that. So maybe we'll have some juicy confessions. Who knows? I think all, all of us have brought something to the table, so it should be a fun time. All of my people who I hate stalk are muggled at people. <laughs> Oh, people are going to love that. <laughs> Wait, uh, I'm a muggle net person or a former one anyway. Well, we still work together, so I don't That's hate true. stalk you. I don't have to hate stalk you. <laughs> you come to me every week during the recording. You're like, I hate record with you. Yeah. <laughs> I hate stare at you over the camera every week. Damn it. It'd be funny if I just like blocked out Laura's frame every week and nobody knew it. I just see me and Pam. <laughs> well, that's when you just take the browser and you move it enough to the side to cut out my picture so that you're yeah. just looking at you and Pam. <laughs> um, see, but the problem right now is you're in the middle of us. You are the middle. Laura, you're in an Andrew Pam sandwich. Oh, where I belong. Yeah, yes. of our cuddle puddle. <laughs> Anyway, that'll be available at patreon.com slash millennial this week. So let's look at the year that was 2023. We're going to go in chronological order here. And we're going to start off uh, with a bit of a bummer. And this was actually a discussion we had very early on in season nine of the show. On January 2nd, Buffalo Bills player Damar Hamlin suffered a cardiac arrest in an NFL game. And it was really bad. I mean, his condition was grave. They canceled the game early. The sports commentators didn't know what to do. I remember seeing it break on Twitter and everybody started tuning in because it was just shocking. And you could tell that the players on the field knew something had gone very, very wrong. And then we had a discussion at the time about the NFL. Not like we have been uh, sport bros, at least up until this event. I'll circle back on that in a moment. But it was a reminder of just how damn dangerous the NFL is. And yet it's so popular. The NFL is so popular. The NFL tries to do things to make the game safer or kind of like deflect from the negative attention. But I watch football games now, believe it or not. And there's a lot of injuries in these games. Some of them are so serious, they don't even show it on a replay. I saw that a week or two ago. This is a very dangerous sport, but we've kind of just moved on from this DeMar Hamlin incident to the NFL's delight, I'm sure. Yeah. And I remember at the time there being a lot of controversy about how long it took the NFL to cancel the game, right? How long it took them to call it quits there. Um, And there was a ton of speculation at the time about 
if the NFL was going to have to make some changes, some really serious safety changes in response to this. And I guess we could ask Micah (laughs) um, if he knows about that. But I don't really think anything has changed. I think I might watch more football than Micah does, (laughs) to be honest with you. He's a basketball guy. (laughs) Listen, I know he is, but he's like our only local like sports guy podcaster. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) I've turned into a bit of a sports bro this year. At the beginning of this year, I would have been shocked if you told me that by the end of this year, I was going to have attended one MLB game, Philadelphia Phillies, one NFL game. The Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders versus the versus the Wisconsin Packers. Pa- wanted to go to the Packers game happening here. One NHL game, Las Vegas uh, Golden Knights, and then two minor league baseball games. And my credit card is still suffering for it. They're expensive tickets. <laughs> yeah, it's an expensive hobby. <laughs> it is. Uh, only the NFL game I actually paid for. It. The rest I didn't pay for, so it's fine. But um, yeah, it's it's actually really fun. To go to a a beautiful baseball park or uh, a football stadium and experience a game, it's it's a good time. Baseball games in particular, Pam, I know you could understand this. It's it's a really fun place to just hang out during the summer or fall. Yeah, it's a really fun atmosphere, especially depending on where you're sitting. I highly recommend the bleachers if you don't know where to sit, because there's always something going on in the bleachers. But yeah, I think that like especially if you're trying to get somebody into the sport, taking them to an actual game is a great way to kind of intro them into the, the, you know, um, getting out of this mentality that it's boring or it can be boring. Cause yeah. I think like the heightened emotions at an actual stadium or yeah. ballpark are way different than if you're just like watching on your couch. I agree with that. You know, I I don't typically consider myself to be a big sports fan. I think I'm more into soccer than I am anything else. Mm -hmm. But I will say I went to an Atlanta Braves game this summer. And I can't Mm -hmm. say I've ever been super into baseball, but I felt more into baseball sitting in that stadium watching us get our asses kicked than (laughs) I have in forever. (laughs) So what you're talking about is very real, Pam. Yeah, yeah. This, like, if anything, just go for the food. Every ballpark right. now is like a foodie <laughs> destination. Yeah. It's the communal experience celebrating together, the the highs, not so much the lows, but it's Well, uh, even the lows you can like mourn with your fellow fans, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, speaking of really uh, scary news, Marvel actor Jeremy Renner, he plays uh Hawkeye in the Marvel movies. He suffered an awful accident, too. Do you guys remember the snowplow accident? Yeah. yeah. This was low-key local news for us in the Bay Area, because Lake Tahoe is like, that's like the ski destination. It's not too far. That's where everybody goes to, to see the snow, if you will. So if anybody in the Bay Area is saying they're going to the snow, they're going to Tahoe. But he was actually trying to help his nephew out of the snow near his home. And I guess Jeremy Renner has a snow cat, which is a very large snowplow, weighs... 15,000 pounds or so. And this machine just completely crushed him. The list of injuries was absolutely insane. So he's really lucky to be alive and uh, feels like he made a very quick recovery too in the grand scheme of just how bad the injuries were. I saw a video of him a month or two ago now running up like a, a hill and he posted it Good on Instagram. Him. Yeah, he was really like proud of himself. It was like a major achievement being able to do that. So, yeah, he seems to be, I don't know how much better, but significantly better compared to the condition he was in initially. I mean, for a snowplow to run over you. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Terrifying. Terrific. Anything else to say there? I feel like I was about to move us on very abruptly. No, it's okay. He's fine now, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> He's fine now. He's all good. Well, you know who's not fine, at least, you know, probably not like mentally, is um, Kevin McCarthy. Uh, and when I say that, I mean like his mental health is probably suffering uh, as he continues to feel the burn of his own caucus uh, a few months after being ousted. Uh, Kevin McCarthy made history twice this year. Um, He became the first Speaker of the House to require 15 floor votes to actually get the speakership, during which he had to make a number of historic 
concessions to his own caucus, including making it easier for them to vote him out if they didn't like what he was doing. And just 10 months later, uh, they did just that. And it was the first time something like that had happened in over 100 years. So congratulations, Kevin McCarthy. You're continuing to highlight the many cracks and fissures that exist in the foundation of American politics, particularly on your side of the aisle. Then moving on from this, we have to talk about February 4th. This was one of the, I would say, first big global events of the year that captured everyone's attention. There were certainly lots of antics that came as a result of this. Who remembers the Chinese spy balloon? Oh, yes. That was, I got wrapped up in it. Like, I was terrified. I thought that was scary. (laughs) (laughs) What did you think it was going to do? (laughs) <laughs> this balloon from China spying on us. What more do you need to know? I was I was like, freaked why out. Why are they spying? Are they yeah. scoping out a, like where to send the bomb? Like what's going on? And just the fact that it was lurking over this country, slowly moving, slowly it was watching. Very ominous. Yeah. Yeah. It was intelligence. It was data mining. It was intelligence gathering. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, they're not going to find much intelligence in this country. Am I right? <laughs> they don't get enough of that on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. In the Discord, Sarah is saying, shit, I 100% forgot about the spy balloons. <laughs> Me too, honestly. See, there you go. This is what we're trying to accomplish today. It was just like the first of many. That was also the crazy part, right? I think there were three total or maybe five or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And they found, they found them... Like, Like over South America, Um, I think they were finding them in, did they find one in Europe? I'm trying to remember where all they found it. They found a couple in the US. They found one in Canada. Right. It was a crazy time. Didn't we end up learning that these balloons or these devices aren't, uh, it's not like this just started this year. This is just the first one to get caught. Yeah. And and be be publicly (laughs) disclosed. Like. This stuff is flying around us all the time, but America doesn't talk about it. Maybe they're going past undetected, but it's been happening. We just didn't know it. Yeah, and we don't know how long it's been happening either. So sleep tight. (laughs) (laughs) Well, some some people that had their money in certain banks were not sleeping tight in the spring. I don't know if you guys remember back in March, a few banks actually ended up failing and the one that I am most familiar with, honestly, is is First Republic, but very similar to what happened in the Silicon Valley Bank. They were catering to wealthy clients and this was helping the deposits grow rapidly, which is really important if you're in banking. But ultimately, this is probably what shot both of these former banks in the foot because they were using these deposits to make larger loans. And this also included jumbo mortgages and we also know the interest rates skyrocketed this year, so it was just not a good time for all of this to happen. And it was a recipe for disaster in a lot of ways. But the reason why these banks failed and we had kind of this mini banking crisis is because people started getting scared and started pulling their money out. And when that happens, banks really left with nothing. A lot of these bank accounts, too, also had deposits that were worth way more than the um, average federally insured sum of $250,000. So that also didn't help matters at all. It was a crazy time. Yes. I remember seeing like these videos of people lined up at the banks trying to pull out their money. Two of these were the biggest bank failures in U.S. history. And some other news, this was one of the biggest stories of the year that we here at the panel on the, on the show definitely have not forgotten about, the Trump indictments. We started with the one in New York in 2023. Then we had a federal indictment in Florida in June. That was the classified documents case. And then in August 2023, the uh, the federal indictment in D.C. And then also in August, the indictment in Laura's home state of Georgia. Hey, y'all. And when these started coming out, the New York one, eh. But once we got that one in June out of Florida related to the classified documents, I was starting to feel convinced like he actually might not be able to run for president again. My expectations have been severely tempered at this point um, when it comes to him not just being able to run, but also to be able to take office again. 
How are you two feeling about the indictments? Are they going to make an impact on the 2024 election? I don't think so, unfortunately. I don't know that we're going to get anything before the election. So it really depends on how the election goes. Um, If it does not go in his favor, I think that he's in a lot of trouble. Yeah. If it does, then I have a lot of questions about what future elections look like in this country. (laughs) Yeah. To be honest. It'll also be interesting to see how voters feel about these indictments. Will they have forgotten about them by fall 2024? Well, I'm sure Biden's going to be reminding everybody that he's a four time indicted ex-president. This has to come up at the debates at least. But if he even participates. Yeah, he doesn't That's what I was just going to say, that he didn't show up to a bunch of them. So he hasn't showed up to these Republican ones. Not that he needs to, in fairness, but the Joe Biden one, I mean, considering he lost to Joe Biden, I really think he it's in his best interest to show up and debate him. You know, Trump will want to. Well, as people let him, I guess, is the question. Yeah, I would just say that it it probably doesn't feel like it's a long time until the election. But in the world of politics, a year is a really, really long time and a lot can happen between now and then. So I would say don't get completely discouraged, but it's certainly worth being concerned. I definitely feel concerned. Also, I really wanted to mention we got the mug shot of Donald Trump in August. I was actually home <laughs> with my family when there were murmurs about the mug shot being imminent. And um, my family was glued to the television waiting for this mug shot to be released. <laughs> I was like, you guys get a life. Like they're sitting there watching MSNBC. You know how it's freaking Democrat wank all the time on on MSNBC. They're hyping everybody up. I did not watch. I'm above this 24 hour news stuff these days. I just wish his hair didn't look so gold in the photo. I wish it looked like white, like some of the other shitty mug shots. You know, my favorite thing about that mug shot is you can tell this motherfucker practiced his facial expression in front of the mirror (laughs) for like hours the night before to make sure that he got the right Look of stoicism and tough guy. Honestly, he did a really good job. I got to give it to him. (laughs) He's very squinty. (laughs) I'll give him that. It's a don't fuck with me face. It's it's great. (laughs) His face loved it. No, seriously. His face Uh, loved it. I mean, come on. uh, My uncle made that his profile picture. (laughs) Oh, Lord. My Republican uncle. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. (laughs) Well, speaking of Trump, in the first half of 2023, we were introduced to all of the various Republican candidates uh, who entered the GOP playing field, like Andrew and Pam were talking about. There have been several debates so far, and uh, former President Trump has not come to any of them. So we've been treated to Chris Christie and Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy and Tim Scott, Ron DeSantis, uh, you know, the the people whose names you've been hearing a lot for the last few years, <laughs> essentially. And the vast majority of them are, um, they're Trumpers at the end of the day. I mean, they've gone on the record to say that uh, if Trump is the nominee, they will support him, no questions asked, despite all of the allegations and everything that happened on January 6th. And, you know, it just goes to show that the, I think the Republican party isn't done with Trumpism and won't be for quite some time. Any uh, favorite GOP candidate moments of 2023 so far, y'all just want to reiterate that that first debate, which we did cover as part of a breaking news installment, I believe, or maybe it was a variety show was such a clusterfuck. Like, we only needed to watch 45 minutes to have enough material to fill an entire segment. It's really gotten to the point where it's it's just mudslinging. Like, there has been so much um, focus and conspiracy around the idea that Ron DeSantis 
is wearing some pretty big lifts in his cowboy boots. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, is it relevant? No. But is it funny coming from a homophobic, like, man-centric, woman-hating fascist wannabe like Ron DeSantis yeah <laughs> it's the mm-hmm. same with his creepy smile that he like forces oh. his face oh, like, yeah, to contort great. into he's like I <laughs> know <laughs> 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 we we didn't talk about this but I, I don't know if you guys watched him debate Gavin Newsom <gasps> yes but that was like oh my god I that know. was the best politics i've seen on television in so long the oh, best man. politics why I, I don't know why his base thought it was a good idea to let him do that yes from an, a purely from an entertainment standpoint fantastic television from a, a campaign standpoint i'm shocked that they would mm-hmm because he came out looking like an idiot yeah and newsom isn't running so it's pointless Right. They really thought that he was going to get up there and like show the um, the Democrats that like he could take on their like top guy, basically. Like, yeah, well, I don't know if like Newsom's like the top guy, but his name is getting tossed around a lot. Right. Yeah. yeah. But they really thought that he could he could go up against someone like that and come out looking great. And mm-hmm. it just really backfired so hard. I feel like. We moved on from that really fast. And I know we didn't cover it here, but it was chef's kiss. (laughs) I'm glad you enjoyed it. (laughs) Honestly, it was a it was a win for Newsom because that was essentially probably one of many pass throughs that Democrats are going to make of auditioning him for 2028 right to potentially yeah. be the candidate there so they they always tend to do this both parties do notice who the people are in the party that they're bringing to the forefront to do things like this to be kind of the attack dog and represent the administration to speak at high profile party events this happened with Barack Obama, for example, as he was ascending and before he ultimately uh, clinched the nomination in 2008, right? Or for the yeah. 2008 mm-hmm. election. So, yeah, keep an eye on Newsom. I wouldn't be surprised if he was a favorite for 2028. I will confess his face kind of scares me. And I know that's a mean thing to say. <laughs> But I think he's so impressive. I think he's so impressive. I think it's just the veneers. I think I see our I just can hear our uh, the (laughs) tapping of our listeners on their phone. Gavin Newsom face (laughs) (laughs) to get a picture. I I guess I see what you're saying. I think it's the slicked back hair. It makes him look a little bit more like grimy. Yeah. You know, than he actually is. I do think that he's he's done some good stuff and you know i agree i I like him i feel like i hear a lot of californians complaining about him do people in la hate him i maybe that's what i'm thinking of they do he's i think that he's really polarizing now in light of a lot of different things including that people were just tired of how long california was shut down during the pandemic and they will Mm. not let him forget that Mm. um but uh, yeah, I mean, like he was mayor in San Francisco when I was still going to school, too. So I've seen his local politics and I've seen his state politics. It's been really fascinating to kind of watch that trajectory because it's not often that you get to see that. So I think he did some good stuff when he was in charge of the city. I think he's done some good stuff. In California, I think definitely he's misstepped a few times. Nobody's perfect, right? Especially right, when you start getting not. climbing the ranks. There's always going to be issues. But if you're looking for, you know, a candidate to watch that's as, as like liberal as you could probably get on the main stage, like he's probably going to be it because he's not as um, I wouldn't say he's as polarizing as somebody like an AOC or a Bernie, but he's still way more left leaning than Kamala and Biden. So 
He's also currently 56, which feels so young compared to Trump and Biden. I know. Okay, we have more to review from this year, but first we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. All right, well, moving on, we've touched on cable news a couple times today, actually. On April 24th, this was shocking in the cable news world. Don Lemon of CNN and Tucker Carlson of Fox News were both fired same exact day. Don had made misogynistic comments and Tucker was fired as a result of the Dominion lawsuit settlement. But the fact that they coincidentally were fired on the same day was mind blowing. Obviously, Fox parting ways with Tucker was a big deal because behind Hannity, he's the the biggest personality on Fox. He's tried to have his own like Twitter show now. Um, and then Don Lemon, obviously a major presence on CNN. He had a primetime show. He tried to do a morning show on CNN for a while. He was always one of the biggest messes during uh, CNN's New Year's Eve bashes. <laughs> um, but yeah, he made some really stupid comments that I think we spoke about at the time, like he was saying like a woman in their 40s is old or something like that. Yeah, he was talking about Nikki Haley and saying that she was beyond her prime. Yeah, yeah. And and <laughs> I forgot about that. And yeah. Don Lemon's female co-host to his face on air live were like, you want to clarify that? And Don just kept doubling down. It was ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, it's not the first time he has stepped in it. Um, do you remember when he was interviewing one of Bill Cosby's alleged victims? Mm -mm. And he was like asking her if basically like, why didn't you bite his dick was essentially the question. And it, this was on live cable news. Um, so he's definitely been... I don't know, questionable for a while. I was not sorry to see either of them go, honestly, um, because yeah. I think, in, oh, of course, in, in different ways, they were both uh, bad. Yes. <laughs> for well said. American audiences. Well, we're going to pivot back into um, politics on a larger stage for a second here so we can talk about Disney versus Ron DeSantis. They were in a big squabble as well mm -hmm. over the course of this year. This kind of all started when um, Florida and DeSantis started doubling down on taking away a lot of gay rights, book banning. Um, they introduced the Don't Say Gay Bill. And Disney was really outwardly vocal coming out against DeSantis for this. And then DeSantis and his camp started screwing with... A couple of Disney stakes, including repealing the Reedy Creek Improvement Act. Uh, this was the thing that was establishing a special governess and taxing district around Walt Disney World and like Buena Vista out in Florida. And Disney was basically like, you're only doing this because we've come out against you. And so they decided to file a lawsuit against DeSantis as a result of this. So uh, I believe that we covered this on the show because, Laura, you have... Uh, you have some uh, historical ties, like family ties to this area, right? Yeah. I mean, I was born in Orlando and I still have a lot of family in central Florida. And one of the biggest things about this story that stuck out to me was how much this hurts taxpayers at the end of the day, um, because sort of not allowing Disney its own... Um, <sighs> I forget even the right term for it, but its own district essentially to handle its own infrastructure and kind of determine how local laws within um, their district are going to be, um, you know, sort of maintained. You then pass all of those obligations on to Florida taxpayers. So at the end of the day, it's, you know, giving taxpayers in Florida a higher tax bill to foot um, rather than truly making a statement to Disney because Disney has Disney has a big enough set of balls that they can swing them anywhere. They don't need to be in Florida. And there was a lot of back and forth commentary between Disney and DeSantis about this exact fact that well, to that 
to that Go point, ahead. they were going to move some of their people to Florida from California. I'm forgetting yep. what teams. And they backed out of that. And it was actually really good news. There was no reason for these people from California to be moving to Florida uh, other than for tax purposes. It would have been cheaper for Disney to have them in Florida. But yeah, they they were showing uh, F- uh, DeSantis what was up. What, what, what happens when you fuck with the mouse? <laughs> I think that's what we <laughs> called the episode, right? I think we had AI Mickey Mouse or I did the voice too. We oh, sent like a right. threatening message to Ron DeSantis, mm-hmm. I believe, something like did. that. Did we actually send that to his office? Because if we oh, didn't, no. we should. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, well, looking to New York just a few days after the infamous Disney and Ron DeSantis fight coming to a head, uh, New York banned gas stoves in new residential constructions, which does not take effect until 2026. But some people lost their minds over this and decided to use it as the latest example of government overreach and the fact that socialism is coming for you and your family and your way of life. (laughs) And this is the harbinger of doom. (laughs) The government is saying (laughs) no more gas stoves. In New York. The reality is there's a ton of science out there that shows gas stoves are actually bad for the environment. They're also bad for your health. It's not great if you have one of these, especially an older one in your home, which is why New York is starting with banning gas stoves in new construction. Obviously, with old construction, there's going to be an element of grandfathering that will probably update over time to get people on, you know, updated models of things and hopefully over to electric. But there was this perception that as of, you know, the start of 2024, everyone was going to have to go out and get an electric stove <laughs> and that you would be illegal if you had a gas stove. And that's not true. Mm-hmm. Um, but people were making memes about it. People were honestly deflecting from a lot of the real issues that do exist in Washington and across the country by using this as their example of government overreach and really wanting this to be the hill they died on. Los Angeles has been working on this too. Uh, New York, uh, the New York story was a little more recent. I will say the one thing, and I think we talked about this at the time, that made sense, that felt like this was reaching too far, is that some people just prefer to cook with a gas stove. I get that. And I'm sure you could still find a gas stove if you really wanted to and get it installed. But yeah, the way the right seized on this was ridiculous. I mean, I'm one of those people. I love my gas stove, mostly because it's way better to heat tortillas up on. Mm. You can't do that with an electric stove. You can't like charbroil a nice tortilla. But also I have a barbecue outside in the backyard. So if the government was like, you got to switch, I'd be like, that's fine. I'll just go and use the barbecue. (laughs) And there's a stove attachment there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, Companies that make home appliances can see the things that people like about gas stoves and find a way to replicate that on electric stoves. Hopefully, things will move in that direction. I think you see that a lot with um, a lot of electric alternatives to gas-fired or gas-powered products, right? Even Mm -hmm. thinking about electric fireplaces, that's a thing. Yeah. So... Or thinking about like electric cars, when you hit the accelerator, it's way more responsive because the drive engine is completely different. But I know at least with Tesla, there's a setting where you can actually kind of have it replicate how a gas car would move. and Because otherwise, the electric cars tend to be a little jumpier when you're pressing on the pedal. So yeah, there's solutions to kind of replicate that old school feeling or experience or style, whatever that that people are looking for. Well, speaking of cooking, McDonald's released the Grimace Shake, and I loved the TikToks of people taking sips of these Grimace Shakes, and then they're like murdered. The camera pans away for a second, and then it cuts back, and they're just like a puddle. Do you guys remember seeing all those videos? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I never understood it. <laughs> it was so stupid. That's why it was so amazing. Um, That's it. The Grimace Shake. 
<laughs> it was it was genius. I thought it was genius because everybody was like, what is in a Grimace shake? Is this the guts of Grimace? Why is it called a Grimace shake? I think it was tied to his birthday. Uh, that was so amazing. Yeah, it wasn't even like a fancy flavor, was it? It was just like purple dye. Tasted like Grimace. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, berry flavored that's milkshake. That's why we're dying. Oh, berry flavored. That actually sounds nice. Celebrated his 52nd birthday. I mean, look, I mean, McDonald's got so much free publicity out of that. Everybody taking these yeah. horror videos with their Christmas shakes. They couldn't have come up with a better advertising campaign than that. No, it was fantastic. Well, speaking of things that we could never forget in <laughs> 2023, we had the Titan submersible. This. Whew. just kind of hooked all of us for a very long weekend. So for anyone who doesn't remember, this was the Ocean Gate submersible. Uh, it was created by somebody that had way too much money. And the <laughs> idea was that people that also had way too much money could pay to go down in this thing and look at the wreckage of the Titanic. And this just went wrong in every single way it could. And... After a few days, we found out that the submersible imploded and because because it wasn't made properly. Right. That, right. That's the big part of the story right. here. And everyone on board perished. We also this was actually one of my favorite guests that we had on this year. We had Mackenzie on. She's a marine uh, biologist conservationist. And it was really fascinating to learn about submersibles from somebody who has experience in that stuff. So highly recommend looping back around to check out that episode if you missed it for whatever reason. Yeah, she was great. Just going through this discussion today, I think this is the story of the year. It captivated the internet. There was a mystery element for several days. It was a commentary on billionaires and how they waste their money. Um, it was a fascinating look at this industry, this deep sea exploration industry, and how they run unchecked. Evidently, we all remember the revelation that this thing was operated with like an Xbox controller. <laughs> yeah, There wasn't just the mystery element. There was a time component too. the clock was ticking. They only had so much oxygen on board. So if the ship, if this vessel was still intact, they had to find these people quick or they were going to run out of oxygen. I remember thinking, as was the whole world, like, What's going on in that vessel right now? And this had the makings of a movie, like just the an incredible only, I story. I bet you the only reason it wasn't greenlit is because of the strikes. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, Probably. we would have seen something by now. Some lifetime movie <laughs> rushed they're, into yeah, production. They're going to do it. Somebody's, yes. Somebody already has the rights now that the strikes are over. Um, but it, it was so funny looking back kind of on all the speculation, all the theories all the conspiracy theories that were afoot. Um, and this really did have the world captivated for like four days. And then we all found out, well, it actually imploded almost right away when it, the day that it went down and the Navy knew about it and just didn't tell us. <laughs> yeah. Well, OK, yeah. The Navy heard a boom, but didn't know what it was. They suspected but yeah, they, right. they had their suspicions. It's just amazing. And then people were also like, um, can we talk about how the Navy has the whole damn sea mic'd up, evidently? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they can hear the whole damn ocean. <laughs> yeah. well, well, and there Laura, was, to your point, it was just like the details coming out of this were like, I feel like every day there was a tiny little detail. Like, didn't they all have a bag lunch that they brought on board too? And so we were all just talking about how like even... Like people with a lot of money, I guess, can only be served a brown bag lunch aboard a submersible. And and there's like a man, makeshift so, toilet on board. So much to unpack here. Yeah. 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 And there was also um, there were reports of that tapping sound. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Right. right. That somebody was allegedly in the submersible, like tapping in Morse code. Morse code. <laughs> and they definitely weren't. Uh, it's one of those like. If a submersible implodes in the middle of the North Atlantic, does it make a sound? No. Until the Navy tells you four days later that it made a sound. Actually, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and then very quickly, we also wanted to talk about the uh, unsung heroes of the sea in 2023, which turned out to be the orcas. They started boat tipping, I guess, to protest <laughs> all of the big boats <laughs> that have infiltrated the sea. So... 
Yeah, that was another big headline, too. My favorite um, meme out of that was the orca whale um, dressed as that Game of Thrones character <laughs> going, I want them to know it was me. Elena Tyrell. <laughs> that was so good. Thank yeah. you. I don't watch that show. Um, God, that was amazing. I think about that meme all the time. <laughs> It's so ridiculous. <laughs> oh, that meme is very all purpose. It is. Yes. Yeah. I want you to know there are a lot of contexts in which you can use that. <laughs> I'm going to drop it in our Discord right now in case anybody forgets. Well, back to the world of politics. We have to talk about how in June the Supreme Court fucked us on student loans, uh, which, you know, was a bummer. But I can't say that anyone was terribly surprised. I was hoping for a better outcome. You know, this court has surprised us from time to time. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw the meme. It's so good still. <laughs> it's so good. <sighs> Tell the rich. I want them to know it was me. <laughs> um, <laughs> the orcas are so poor out of their work. <laughs> uh, anyway, where was I with that? I was hopeful that the court was going to surprise us because they have surprised us in the past. Uh, Kavanaugh and Coney Barrett can kind of be wild cards, which can be unexpected. Uh, but they weren't. They fucked us. And uh, there's still not really a great answer to the student debt problem, although the Biden administration is continuing to try and find avenues to provide some form of debt relief. Um, I would keep an eye on, you know, the next year or so, because I'm sure that's going to be a pretty big part of the platform. But I will say one way in which uh, this court did surprise us was around voting rights, um, because they actually shot down Alabama's congressional map, which was found to have heavily gerrymandered uh, their districts to the point where the vast majority of their Black population was only represented by one district. And the court ultimately found that to be in violation of the Voting Rights Act and unconstitutional. So, even the court knows sometimes some of these issues are so obvious that they will definitely be on the wrong side of history if they uh, fall on the opposite side of this argument. So glad to see that. <laughs> Keeping us on our toes. July 5th was a very big day for the social media world. Threads launched the Twitter ripoff from Facebook following all of the drama that's ensued in the Elon Musk era. I was very excited about Threads. I continue to be very optimistic about Threads. I don't post too often there, but if I'm going to post, I'm thinking about posting on Threads first. Threads has been adding a lot of features over the last few months. They really do seem serious about making this a very good product and a real Twitter competitor. I'm never calling it X, by the way. I will al always call it Twitter. Um, they just added hashtags, by the way, and they're doing it differently than other social media networks, including Facebook and Instagram. Um, you're, you, you can like you hit the hashtag button to start a hashtag, but when it appears in a post, you actually don't see the hashtag in front of it. And a hashtag can actually have um, a space in between two words. You know, like oh. if you tried to do that on Twitter, you wouldn't be able to. So they're mm. calling them just topics instead of hashtags. And I follow like tech bloggers and I see a lot of like the tech tags now. So like the algorithm seems to show you more stuff that you seem to like. I find the algorithm pretty good in general and it seems to get even better with this new tag feature or topics feature. So are you two using threads at all or what? No. Mm. <laughs> Not with much you know, regularity, but I try and pop in and post something every once in a while. They have been heavily promoting it in Facebook and Instagram. You see a carousel showing threads that you might be interested in. Instagram and Facebook are obviously huge. So they're really trying to um, make this thing blow up. So that's actually one reason why I continue to use threads. I see them promoting it in Facebook and Instagram, where, of course, hundreds of millions of people are. And... If they're trying to get more people over to threads, then I want to be there posting. I want my threads to appear in people's Instagram and um, Facebook feeds as well. So that's why I've been mm -hmm. posting from time to time. And in entertainment news, the summer was the year of Barbenheimer. Did anybody here except for me actually watch both back 
to back or no. in close succession. Okay. Barbie That's only. Really crazy one. <laughs> and I still haven't seen Oppenheimer. It's good. I, the honestly, the um, the sound mixing was really interesting the way that they chose to kind of utilize sound in that movie. But um, yeah, this was like the um, movie theater destination for the summer. It was kind of nice to see movie theaters packed again because I I go fairly regularly to the movies, but it's very rare that you see a a theater packed and it was really cool to go out and see both of these movies and see them in an audience setting. And it was so cool seeing people so excited for Barbie, dressed up for Barbie. Like we went opening yeah. weekend. The hype was real. It felt like a I Harry felt Potter out of place. Or Twilight. I, I don't I uh, realized I didn't own any pink before we went oh. to see Barbie. And I, I felt out of place because the whole theater looked like it was just like doused in pink. It was great. <laughs> well, uh, since we're just talking about Oppenheimer, it might be good for us to talk about something that's older than the atomic bomb. So <laughs> let's talk about Glitch McConnell. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Do you think you'll be running again for re-election? Silent answer response. I am still convinced that he was shitting his pants. <laughs> that is my thought to this day, because you see the man blank out and just get that hundred yard stare. He's looking through the walls and behind the press in front of him and nothing can break that gaze. It's because he's shitting his depends. Laura knows what it's like to shit your depends and the, I do. the face I'm an you expert. make. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it happened a month later, too. He he yeah. like blacked out a second time in August and it felt unreal to be witnessing this fall in real time. Like this is televised. This is history. This is this is how he's going to be remembered. Staying too long. Yeah. And he's not the only one. I mean, Diane Feinstein was another example of this. Yeah. Um, of course, she she did end up passing not too mm-hmm. long ago. But that's another example of, you know, someone who has a legacy. And depending on where you fall, you know, on, you know, which side of the aisle you fall on politically, She had a legacy that has kind of been tarnished by the fact that she stayed in her seat so long that she was relying on her aides to help her figure out how to uh, participate in a floor vote and tell Mm -hmm. her when to vote yay. And it just isn't a good look all around. I think we had an entire discussion on this show about the average age of Congress in general being sort of in the mid 60s, whereas the average age of America is 38. And that this mismatch just feels so unrepresentative of who we are as a people. We're ready for, you know, some of these older members of Congress who clearly are not fit for whatever reason to serve anymore to step down. And Mitt Romney is actually one of the ones who announced he is going to do that Mm -hmm. before he gets too long in the tooth to be, you know, acting as a senator. So kudos to him. In the case of McConnell and Feinstein, they, it seems like they get, and these other older senators, it seems like they get addicted to the power. They don't want to just like ride off into the sunlit sunset and chill on September 21st, news Corp and Fox mogul Rupert Murdoch announced his retirement. That was a big deal. Uh, he's credited as being like the architect of Fox News. So good riddance on on that front. All right. More fun to be had today. But first, we are going to be taking a quick break. We'll be right back. September 29th, The Sphere opens right here in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. It's an incredible venue. I saw you two there. Um Back in September or October, I went to like the second or third show. It felt like a theme park experience, that venue. It's just like all encompassing, not just like the theater itself, but also the concessions area felt like something straight out of a Disney park. You walk into the venue and like even in like the um, the entryways and all that, like they're playing special music. It's it's so unique. I actually learned while we were planning this discussion that, Laura, your mom is going to be visiting the Sphere. 
Yep. She is going to be going to see um, the love of your life, Bono, <laughs> or the second love of your second life. Love. I, yeah, I think Bruce love. comes first, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, my mom is going. And Andrew says to me, well, what? Your mom was going to go to the sphere and you, you weren't going to tell me? You didn't think that I might want to go to the sphere with your mom? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. I'll ask her. Date night. Well, what we agreed is that so your mom's going with her girlies. And if one of them happens to back out and and there's like a spare ticket, I'll jump in on that party. There you go. Well, and see, I was sitting here being like, Andrew, you want to go with my mom and her friends to (laughs) the sphere? And then I was like, oh, who am I kidding? Andrew went to um, Downton Abbey in theaters. He was probably the youngest person (laughs) in that theater. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, we were. I was I was in Tahoe and I spent a <laughs> night seeing the Dalton Abbey movie at their local movie theater, which was actually really cute. It wasn't a chain. And then the commercials running before the movie are like, if you need a new pair of socks, come over to the sock shop here in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> and the commercial ran like five times because they have nothing to advertise there. <laughs> I was playfully saying, why didn't your mom invite me to this? But um, I hope your mom has a good time here. I don't think it was so playful. I think you were a little bit serious, but it's okay because I already told her. <laughs> you know, you know, I do everything for the show. And I know our listeners would love if I took your mom out on uh, the Las Vegas strip, got her nice and drunk. We were crazy night out with Mama T. <laughs> crazy yeah. night out. It'd be wild. Hey, she listen, don't don't overcommit because she's fun and she <laughs> will know. take you up on it. <laughs> No, I'm excited for her. That'll be great. So we're going to cover a bit more entertainment news for you all. Of course, NSYNC made their big comeback this <laughs> year as well. This is more big recent comeback. news. Big as a uh, an understatement, depending on who you ask. But I feel like the, the teasing that led up to their first single being released in, you know, um, almost 20 years or so was it kind of captivated all millennials because this was a big band for us. So Better Place is streaming now. It was pretty much just all marketing for Trolls 3, which we've now kind of come to terms with. But um, yeah, we we talked about this on the show as well. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like by the time Trolls 3 actually hit theaters, everybody forgot that NSYNC had this new song because they released it like yeah. two months before the movie came out. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it was fun to see them hyping up some sort of reunion and then getting this song. I guess it's better than nothing, but I I didn't find the song very replayable. So I listened once or twice and that was it. I just remember all the drama that came as a result of, you know, their reunion at the VMAs, getting all of those really candid Taylor Swift reactions that kind of helped, I think, um, increase the hype for people and then getting the letdown a couple of days later or maybe a day later of it just being a single from trolls three mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah we were all like uh yeah all right <laughs> better than nothing i guess and sinks back all right <laughs> <laughs> well we can't talk about in sync without talking about britney spears equally as big when we were growing up she published her much anticipated memoir this came out at the end of october i think i'm the only one that actually read it on this panel (laughs) oops it's okay um a lot of the big headlines made their way onto the internet so there really was no need to to tune into this unless you were curious about the full context that's the thing and actually same thing with spare the prince harry book which we'll mention in a little bit uh, the New York Times, these other websites, they read the book in advance and then tell you all the biggest revelations. And then I'm sort of just like, oh, why do I need to read this myself? But I'm happy she finally got her story out there. Yeah. And it's always the most salacious details, right? Like Brittany revealing that Justin maybe isn't uh, the most well endowed or Prince Harry talking about having a frostbite penis yeah, um, that that's always the stuff that Noticing ends up making a pattern headlines. here. <laughs> that's what sells books. The dick revelations, the dick stories. <laughs> she also said, by the way, on Instagram, she's going to release a volume two. Did you see that? Like next year? No, I guess we'll see no, if she actually I does. That. But yeah, she's is she Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... 
So moving on to a, a larger pop culture story, which we did not cover on this show. The Beatles also released what they're calling their fi- the final Beatles song. So this came out uh, early November. It's called Now and Then. And the reason this came about is so fascinating. This might be like one of the better uses of AI I think we've seen this year because this song has existed for a while. It was a demo that John Lennon recorded before he passed and they could actually never use it because of the way that it was recorded. It was recorded on a cassette tape, cassette tapes. They, you know, uh, experience wear and tear. The Also, the audio was not that great. They couldn't really figure out how to balance John's voice with the piano that he was playing on. And the only reason that they were finally able to extract this audio and separate John's voice from the piano on the demo is because of AI technology that was specifically developed for Peter Jackson's documentary, Get Back. This premiered in 2021 on Disney Plus, and it chronicled the making of the Beatles' Let It Be album. So they were able to use this um, AI and technology to bring this song to life, which is just so incredible. And they had been workshopping this in the 90s. They tried to work on this track before. So they also had uh, George Harrison on here as well because they had saved the um, the material from that. I think that Paul ended up re-recording his guitar parts, but as an homage to George. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think Laura and I both watched the, there's a 12 minute, minute documentary that you can now watch on YouTube about the making of this track. And I like, I had chills. It like moved me to tears because it's, it is so, um, it, it's just so overwhelming to hear like such a, a huge voice, you know, I know like that. And the song is very melancholy. Is that how you would describe it, Pam? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so there, there's that layer to it, too. And I think what really struck me about this is that in an era where we hear so much about deceased artists coming back for hologram tours or new albums... This is actually one of the first cases where it feels like this was done tastefully. I don't know if you would agree, Pam, but I think my frame of reference probably rests entirely on some of the chatter we've heard about Selena, um, one of, you know, yours and my favorites from when when we were little kids, um, making a comeback. And her family has talked about doing a hologram tour with her. And sometimes just depending on the approach and the tone that is set with this kind of thing, it can feel like a cash grab, which feels gross. But that's not what this felt like. And I think it's in part because you had living members of the Beatles who were also on board and heavily involved. And it it kind of felt like a, a full circle moment for them in a way where they, they got to be together again. And there was something very wholesome about that, that I think we don't usually get in these types of, I don't know how you would describe it. Reimagining. Well, I, new I work. think <laughs> what's unique about this and you're kind of getting at this, all four Beatles worked on this song. It yes. started with John and then the other three fleshed it out in the nineties. Couldn't get it done because of the issue that Pam described with the piano and the vocals. Then George passed, but he had already worked on it. And then Paul and Ringo finished it out just last year thanks in part to Peter Jackson. It was truly a Beatles song. They all worked on it together. I think that's the key. And it's also a good song. Like sometimes you get a song, like Queen will release a song from Freddie from like 20 years ago and it's trash. Like this is a genuinely good song, I think. Yeah. Some larger stories from 2023 will cycle through really quick. First of all, just mentioned this technology, AI, AI, AI. It was one of the biggest stories of the year. ChatGPT got a lot of attention around the world and on this show. But there was a lot of other demonstrations of AI that were very impressive. There have been a lot of great image generation tools 
coming out of Adobe and um, Mid Journey and other places over the last year. Really amazing stuff. Like with Adobe, you can expand an image. So like I can have a picture of a mountain and I can expand that mountain to the left and right. And I've done this. It's really impressive. It works really well. So there's just a lot of AI is moving so fast and it'll be fascinating to see where we are this time next year. Also, a big theme of this year, the Federal Reserve rose interest rates in America. Now it does seem like they are finally slowing down the number of rate hikes, which people are relieved to see after so many rate hikes over the last couple of years. Also, have to mention inflation. It did sort of improve by the end of the year. There have been some good inflation reports in recent months, and we've touched on them from time to time. Things are still too expensive, but... When we talk inflation, we're talking about the rate at which it's moving upward, the speed, and it has slowed down. Those price increases have slowed down. So that's good. Let's look at summer and fall of 2023. Ah, what a year it was for love, Taylor and Travis. And then we had the Ares tour. Pam, was this your story of the year? I I mean, I think this year for me was the year of the Ares tour for sure. It took up so much of um, the first half of my year. And also like... The last few months of the year before, because you had to get tickets for this thing. And that was a crazy experience. We talked about that on the show, too. So, yeah, that was that was a big one for me, for sure. Are you enjoying following the coverage of Taylor and Travis? Because there's a lot of it. Yeah, I I mean, (laughs) against my better judgment, I am because I just think it's so sweet. It is. Listen, he went to the Ares tour with a friendship bracelet and a dream and it worked out for him. The the story writes itself, you know, it's like straight out of a rom-com. Yeah. This was also a year of strikes, very large strikes. Uh, There were many, but uh, the two big, big ones were the auto uh, worker strike and the Hollywood strikes. The which were the actors and the writers, two separate strikes going on in Hollywood. Um, all three of those are resolved now. So that's good to see. For now. Let's, <laughs> for now, yeah. Quick cancellation report. Lizzo was canceled and then uncanceled, seemingly by Beyonce. <laughs> that's kind of a big deal because she doesn't talk a lot about yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, Lizzo has really good PR. I think we've learned from this. <laughs> Wanted to also mention the creator of the Dilbert comic strip series, Scott Adams. He had been can- he was canceled after he characterized black people as a hate group. I wanted what? to mention this, yeah, because uh, I used to love Dilbert as a kid, so I was shook by his comments. Also, this is very recent. George Santos canceled on Capitol Hill. <laughs> now, Laura, two people have noticed now that at the top of last week's episode. You accidentally called George Santos Matt Santos, which appears to be a reference to the West Wing. It is. It is. Um, it's the better Santos, uh-huh. I would say. And uh, I was horribly embarrassed when this was pointed out to me that I made this slip. But um, I'm thinking about the West Wing at least 40 percent of the time. So it tracks. <laughs> it very much does. When I heard that, either in editing or live, I was like, wait, is that his actual first name? I just couldn't remember George in the moment. So I just like let it go. Yeah, it was an autopilot moment for sure. (laughs) Oh, she's a real West Wing fan. Thank you to uh, Mario who wrote in and uh, somebody in our Facebook group. Sean. Sean, thank you. (laughs) They're keeping an eye on us. We appreciate it. Also, speaking of congressional fuckheads, we didn't mention this guy on the show, but Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey indicted on federal corruption charges. He's still in office. However, he has refused to leave. It does seem like if you stick it out in a lot of cases, no matter how damning the allegations, people will just forget and you get to sneak by. And this might be what happens with Bob Menendez. We'll see. Yeah, it shouldn't be. He's got to go. Yeah. Santos had to go and so does this guy. Um, but I think we can't go without mentioning that uh, one of my favorite senators, Fetterman, um, got a cameo from George Santos for Menendez because after Santos was ousted from Congress, he immediately became a cameo star. <laughs> 
and has made a lot of money. I know he charges like $200 a video. And he has said he has made $200,000 now, which is more than the salary of a senator, (laughs) which is $174,000 per year. Unreal. (laughs) I think that he's just showing that, you know, for boomers, their pipeline is politics to talking head on cable news, right? Politics to cable news. That's that's the pipeline for boomers. Uh, For millennials, I think it's just... Congress to influencer, social media personality. (laughs) And honestly, I don't know how many of these cameos y'all have seen. They keep coming up in my fucking for you page on TikTok. Same. Hmm. I don't I don't hate him as a cameo star. I wish this was where he started. (laughs) He is funny. But this is this is a discussion for another time. But it is shitty that people are paying this terrible person. I know. This horrible, corrupt liar to record a 45 second video. They're they're lifting him up. Nobody should be supporting this guy. He's a stain on Congress. He what? is. But did you see the video where he was like, <laughs> but who cares? Look at this video <laughs> where he was like, he was like the foundation of Congress is built on the bodies of homosexuals in both parties. <laughs> if he starts exposing senators for the uh, hypocrites that they are, then maybe I'll forgive him. Um, stuff like that is very funny. All right. Well, to end on a uh, somber notes. Just wanted to also acknowledge some big names who passed over the last year. Matthew Perry, Tina Turner, Jerry Springer. I mean, you know, say what you want about the guy. His show is iconic. Jimmy Buffett. I remember he died like right at the beginning of the summer. And people were like, oh, that's so Jimmy Buffett to die right as summer. <laughs> Margarita season is is getting underway. Uh, Sinead O'Connor, Suzanne Summers, Bob Barker, who was my 2023 production. And uh, Lisa Marie Presley. All died. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the big names who we lost this year. Yeah. Some of these were shocking. Matthew Perry. Him especially. Yeah. Yeah. That was very shocking. Well, Andrew's going to be looking at um, who was ending 2023 at the age of 99 so he can make his predictions (laughs) for who's going (laughs) to die in 2024. Yeah. Stay tuned for my 2024 (laughs) predictions. Rosalind uh, Carter, too. I think yeah, that, that's she a just big passed. One I shouldn't forget. Oh yeah, yeah. her former yeah. first lady. I will not predict that uh, Jimmy is going to die. I, I refuse. I, I don't want to put that into the world. He deserves to live a few more years out on the peanut farm and peace. Absolutely, so. absolutely. Honestly, he's a force of nature. Mm-hmm. So, Lauren, Pam, what were your? If you had to pick one, your story of the year for me, it's the sub. Uh, do we have to pick different ones? You don't have to. <laughs> because I was going to say the sub, mainly because we were all so captivated. Yeah. Yep. Also, Laura's a Titanic girly through and through. So yes. this was, yeah, I get it. Uh, I, I kind of already said mine. I still think it's, for me, it's the Eras tour. Okay. It's big pop culture moment and a big moment for me. Yeah. You got to go. Very exciting. Are you going to stream it at home? comes out December 13th. I would prefer to just wait and buy it, honestly, at the price. I mean, it's not I I, I do want to go on the record also saying that like the price is not unreasonable. It's very much in line with early rental releases. 20 bucks. It's what we've seen for almost everything, af- especially as a result of the that theater exclusivity window getting shorter and shorter. Um, and I just wanted to go on the record and say that I know that our listeners know, but if this ever gets out to other people that don't know, there's there's a lot of people that were kind of bitter about the price. And I, I don't think that that was unreasonable. I agree with that. Those early rental releases tend to be very expensive right around that $20 mark. So, yeah. All right. So we asked our supporters on Patreon, what's the headline you will remember from 2023 when you look back on this year? What is the one headline that will stand out? First one here comes from Cherie, who says, for me, it's the WGA SAG strikes ruined my year as someone who works in the industry. Cherie, I don't know if you guys remember, she uh, works, uh, she's an IATSE union member, and she sent us a little blurb about how that affected her when IATSE was on the verge of striking. So it makes sense. 
Kristen says, I suppose the interest rate hikes because they impacted me personally, FU student loans. But as far as a popular talking point, it's the sub. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) The Titan submersible. Amber is in agreement with Pam. Amber said, I'd say Taylor Swift overshadowed most things this year, but that might just be me. And Rachel also agreed with Amber and Pam. She said, definitely Taylor. Shelby says, for me, the submersible, I had my first baby in late May and I was in a newborn haze when this happened. And it was the first slash only piece of outside news that broke into my bubble. Embarrassing that I wasn't keeping up with any other news, but I was doing my best. Uh, I mean, I think you can cut yourself some slack. You yeah, just I had think your so first too. baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Destiny also says, definitely the sub incident. I'm a huge Titanic fanatic. So this to me is just tragic. Yep. I agree. But also the memes. The memes were great. The memes are why we're all going to hell. (laughs) And they're coming back around, too. I I don't know if you've seen this, Laura. It's like, I'm going to get coal for Christmas because I reposted all those Titans. Oh, man. (laughs) I do feel bad for a couple people on the submersible, but uh, just not the rich people. Right. Right. There was like an explorer on there, too. But he had been down there so many times. Ugh, whatever. We don't need to get back into this. James said, definitely Henry Kissinger uh, finally biting the dust. Hallelujah. Yes. Fair. And then James also said, oh, wait, also Prince Harry's memoir, especially about his Todger. Skull emoji, skull emoji. Yeah, the, the dick stuff. Oh, is Todger slang for dick? I mean, I'm guessing. It's got to be, right? Okay. <laughs> it is. Kind of. It, 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 it gives It gives dick. <laughs> Sorry, Jasper just opened the, my bedroom door. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> now he's just like in the room. Are you freaked <laughs> out? Scared the crap out of me. Aww. Kind of because I thought I closed. <laughs> no, he came in. He wants to talk about Prince Harry's Todger. Let him speak. I Let him so. speak. <laughs> Ashley said this year, Def the Titan submersible. It took the whole internet by storm for better or worse. We got some great memes out of a horrific tragedy. Uh, and then Sarah says, probably Damar Hamlin, since we were watching it live. My boyfriend is a big Bengals fan. Also, the submarine and Santos. <laughs> so um, three different stories that we've covered here today. Definitely mm-hmm. big impact for 2023. And finally, another Sarah, Sarah S. said, maybe it's just because it's my industry, but the collapse of the Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah. So those were the submissions we got from patrons. Thanks, everybody, for contributing. We always appreciate hearing what you have to say. And thanks, everybody, for supporting us on Patreon if you do that. We really, really appreciate it. We couldn't do the show without you. Don't forget, also, if you want to support us a different way, maybe not via Patreon, we have the Overstock Store. MuggleMillennial.etsy.com is where you can buy Millennial Adulting Planners and 2020 t-shirts. They've got the year 2020 on fire. They're really cool. By the way, a quick clarification about the adulting planners. These are not year-specific planners. It's 104 blank weeks, and you can write the week in if you would like. Um, The reason I bring this up, somebody had actually asked us if um, it's for specific years, and it's not. So don't feel like, oh, I can't purchase this anymore because it's only good for 2024 or 2023. And what's also great about the weeks being blank is that you could skip a week if you want. Like You don't have to use it every week. Maybe you forget or you're taking a vacation, whatever. Um, You can just use this in any 104 weeks that you choose. It covers two years of your life. It's evergreen. It's mugglemillennial.etsy.com. We already told y'all what's coming up in After Dark, so patrons can stay tuned for that. After Dark is part of Mega Millennial, which is the main show, ad-free, with After Dark attached at the end. Apple Podcast paid subscribers also get access to Mega Millennial. If you're a Spotify user, you can uh, click the Patreon banner within the show page on Spotify and pledge, and you can also receive our audio benefits right within the Spotify app. That is another big new uh, bit of news for 2023. Thank you to Spotify and Patreon. Um, All right. Well, it's time now for recommendations. Laura, what do you have for us this week? I have a game recommendation, of course, uh, called Lethal Company. The premise of this, it's essentially cosmic horror existentialism. 
with some space monsters thrown in. You're essentially um, part of a crew that is collecting scrap off of various moons and alien territories. And you do so at great personal risk to yourself and not very much reward from the aforementioned company. It's really, really fun. It's a great game to play with friends online. So if you're looking for a game that you can play with your friends, if maybe they're not you know, in town for the holidays, or if you don't live close to each other, this is a really fun and easy way to spend time together. It's very simple. You're going to collect scrap and trying to survive. And so there are fun, some fun jump scares, but it leaves a lot of opportunity to just hang out and kind of shoot the shit. So okay, check it out. For my skincare girlies, I want to recommend CeraVe's Acne Foaming Cream Cleanser. It's got 4% benzyl peroxide acne treatment within it. I use it twice a day. It's super helpful for managing my face day to day. Uh, There's no fragrance on this. I've been only using it for like a year and a half. I should have been using it for way longer, but I got this recommendation. And of course, people love CeraVe products. I think, Pam, you've mentioned one once or twice at least. So this is what I use for my day-to-day skincare and keeping the acne under control. So I would recommend that. Yeah, great. Great for sensitive skin too. Like if you have um, psoriasis, eczema, any kind of like sensitive skin stuff. Um, I've never used this one though, so I might look into oh, it. Okay. I, but I don't have acne, so maybe not. But I mean, it sounds great. You, get the hy- <laughs> you have the hyaluronic acid in there, the niacinamide. Do you feel like your skin texture is better too? Like are your pores like a little bit smaller. I think I think so. Yeah, it's been a yeah. while since I haven't used this. But yes, I have definitely noticed a difference, especially just with pimples popping up throughout the week. Mm-hmm. I have managed to keep them under control, I think, largely in part to this. Nice. Mm-hmm. I wanted to recommend Renaissance, a film by Beyonce, the other big tour <laughs> that happened this year. I did go see this at the movies. The crowd was not as large as it was for the Ares tour. And I think that was mostly a marketing Flub by Beyonce's team, because as we talked about on the show, they really did announce, do a big announcement saying that you could buy tickets now. And I think that that's why a lot of people didn't realize that this was coming out when it was. But yeah, it was really good. Um, I just I have so much respect for Beyonce as an artist and just getting to see how she put this tour together was incredible. If you've seen any of her other um tour films, then you'll be very familiar with how she kind of lays these documentaries out. So it's a really nice mix of behind the scenes footage and also of footage from the concert, or in this case, it was concerts. So you get to see like all of the fashion, all of like the numbers spliced together, and then a lot of how she went about constructing the tour to begin with. Um, It is rather long. I think it's about three hours. So if you don't want to sit in a theater, then maybe hold off until this is available to rent, but definitely worth watching if you're a fan, even if you're a casual fan. I think that, um, yeah, it's just incredible to see how she put this together. I think I'm going to go see it over the holidays when I'm bored at home with Pat. That and Rent Tay-Tay's movie. So they will keep me occupied. Yeah, that'll be at least five hours of concert entertainment to keep us uh, busy over the holidays. So. All right. Well, if you have any feedback about today's episode, you can email Millennial Show at gmail.com or you can use the contact form or anonymous confessional on Millennial Show dot com. You can also follow us and engage with us on social media. We'd love to get your feedback that way as well. We're Millennial Show on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and threads. And then over on TikTok, we are Millennial Pod. After Dark starts in a moment for Patreons and Apple Podcast subscribers. We'll be back next week with our final episode of the year. Hope everybody enjoyed this year in review. Goodbye, 2023. Good riddance. Good riddance, I guess. <laughs> Honestly, great year for me. No notes. No notes. I'm social now. Thanks, yeah. everybody, for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.